Steve's present position um, is uh, team leader and he's been working at STARS for almost uh, 14 years in various roles, including senior counsellor, coordinator intake and assessment, coordinator early intervention program. Uh, the topic of Steve's talk is identifying trauma and working with survivors of tra torture and trauma. Please join me in welcoming Steve Thompson. Um, in a way, our growth is a failure. Ideally, um, if we um, could abolish torture and the ill treatment of refugees, and asylum seekers, we wouldn't need to exist. Um, so unfortunately, that's not the case. Our new phone number, by the way, if you want to know it, it's 8206 8900. So um, 8206 8900. That's business stuff, and I thought I'd better get that out of the way straight away. Um, I'm not going to have time to do all of this because I've got 20 minutes. Um, but. Uh, I always try and take um, the opportunity to speak about torture and war trauma because it's something we're mostly silent about. Uh, if there's one thing that governments that torture and abuse human rights want from us is our silence. The same silence that they inflict on their victims. briefly about STARS. So it's been going since 91 um, and uh, you know I'm sort of the old man of the ship now. Um, I, I feel like I'm about to disembark but um, uh, it, it, it's interesting you know. Um, it, it, we, I, I feel like you know no matter how long you work in the area particularly mental health um, I like to think you remain a novice. I feel like um, uh, this is an area of enormous complexity. It's very finely nuanced. You deal with, well, certainly I'm sure you deal with um, individuals with very high needs, with layers of issues, with enormous complexity. And I've learned most from those people I've worked with. Um, and I think... Um, when you feel that uh, you get to the point where you, you kind of feel like you've, you've got a handle on everything. The reason I've been so long at STARS is I've never had that sense. Um, so um, we've, we run a number of programs, as you can see there. Um, I'm the team leader in the adult counselling, so we have 10 staff. We have a sessional psychiatrist, a couple of psychologists, um, a, num a number of social workers, counsellors. So it's a very, it's a multidisciplinary team, even within the adult counselling. Um, our child and youth program, which works principally in schools and deals with um, children of war trauma and child soldiers, which again, we could spend the whole time dealing with that issue. Um, we also have staff at Inverbrachi and at Sherga um, uh, near Weeper. And we've just moved some staff out of Port Augusta, so you know we've scattered a little. We also run and are about to start again a natural therapies program. Um, for survivors of torture, touch becomes um, um, associated with abuse and with pain. And in many uh, parts of the world, particularly um, throughout Europe and Scandinavia, this is the, the first um, treatment is to try and get an association with human touch, with kindness and, and tenderness and, and, and gentleness um, rather than pain. And we run the, an education program as well. Oh, look, this is a very bold mis mission statement. And as I said, we've, we've failed miserably in terms of uh, abolishing torture. It's become more prevalent. And tragically, we now have um, some... Um, we have had politicians and regrettably we have some, uh, some uh, academics, quite prestigious academics in Australia, uh, trying to tell us that there are occasions when torture is justifiable. You know, ticking bomb scenarios 
you know, with lives at threat and, you know, if we can torture them and get the information and save lives is, is a wonderful um, uh, moral dilemma in a philosophy class. But believe me, it's a slippery slope once you start justifying torture. The law of, inc of, of increment. Authorities uh, always exceed their powers in terms of what they can do with prisoners and detainees. I wanted to, um, because of the time, I thought uh, rather than go through all of the kinds of experiences that um, uh, refugees might have and that most of you would be aware of prior to their arrival here in Australia and what they might experience as trauma within Australia. Um, uh, this is just a poem to one of my clients um, uh, who was a Sarajevan man uh, who um, one afternoon at Stars um, upturned a table and stormed out in the middle of a session with me and uh, I, I wrote this for him. So when picking up body parts, hands are the hardest to hold, he said. Exploded pieces of men thrown into blue summer sky to land in blooming fields amongst the stones and sculpted trees. He remembers well a few that fell under a canopy of small flowers, the touch of the soft coloured petal, the flesh of the metal torn hand. For this is the place where the inner war began. Here the heart tightened to sharpen the loss. Now sweet-scented bud only keeps grief alive. Sarajevo, your war still falls in pieces around us. What had happened was, um, I'm, I wasn't aware of what had happened, but he was a, a very heavy smoker and we always sat outside and we had a, um, a jasmine plant that was very sweet-smelling. And when he sat down, he lasted about three minutes and then he just uh, had a panic episode. And then he explained that he refused to get involved in the war, so he was recruited uh, as a, under forced labour, um, and uh, his job, they made him dig trenches and pick up body parts in the surrounding hills of Sarajevo. Um, so again, this notion that uh, for the person who's endured trauma, the world is... Uh, field is populated with triggers, with reminders. It's hard to forget. So, you know, we won't spend time, you know, the, the kinds of things, you know, you know, even individuals that have been in war zones and, and, and perhaps um, civilian populations are increasingly targets. Most deaths are civilian deaths now in wars. You know, in World War I, most deaths were, were soldiers and military personnel. Um, you could identify the soldiers because they had uniforms. The, the, the world, the nature of war has changed dramatically. So, you know, they're, 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 these are some of the experiences they might have uh, dealt with. Um, most of our work is those who have been very traumatised by war and in particular those who have been imprisoned and, and tortured. So most of the work that I've done in the 14 years um, at STARS have been with survivors of torture. And you, we're all aware of, you know, um, you flee a country, you know, you get a humanitarian visa, you're resettled in another country, not of your choice, and, and then and you don't speak the language and the culture is unfamiliar to you and you might experience racism and... and uh, I assume you've got a copy of this, have you? Yeah, so people can, I guess, spread it round. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Torture itself, again, is something that, um, and, and I don't want to spend any time going through the forms of torture. Um, these uh, gross abuses of human rights um, uh, have many shapes. In fact, um, what other human beings can do to inflict pain on another human being is limited only by the hum human imagination. And um, uh, it's a very dark, uh, and, and it's one of the problems that um, often with new staff that you have to be careful of is that, um, is the area, I'm sure you would have touched upon this in this conference, is the whole area of vicarious traumatisation, that you yourself become uh, uh, seduced by despair. Uh, 
um, at um, a life that appears to have um, paused and frozen in time because of trauma. And once again, you know, uh, these are experiences. Um, uh, uh, Brian Keenan, if you've ever read An Evil Cradling, it's, if you know nothing much about being imprisoned and um, ill-treated, read it. Um, the whole notion of the despair that creeps in. Uh, you see, you have to be imprisoned to be tortured, otherwise, of course, you'd run away. Um, so um, they often experience long periods of... Um, isolation. I like to think of the experiences of torture in terms of the trauma of it in a, under, in a number of ways. I think the very first thing that happens prior to imprisonment is what I call the, the way one's experiential world contracts. And so, you know, um, me, I always um, talk to um, people about when war began for them. You know, it's not what's documented in in history books. You know, when did you first be, were frightened, fearful, anxious? When did these hostilities begin to affect you personally and your family? That's when the war begins for them. And quite often they will mention, well, it's a military presence on the streets, curfews, restrictions on your movement. Um, and, of course, what happens is you then retreat from the street because people are killed and you hear of disappearances. Eventually, your home itself is invaded and you're arrested. Um, this is usually done at night. Um, documents are seized. Family members may also be abused. Um, and then you're imprisoned. You're taken. Uh, you don't know where you are. Um, you're held in a prison. Um, and then... F you know, ultimately the invasion is to the surface of your own skin. So you know, I want to give you this sense that, you know, it's a, a world is slowly contracting. And I often think in terms of when I'm dealing with um, mental health issues with uh, torture survivors, is that's what's happened. The world is no longer rich and expansive and filled with possibilities. It's, it's frozen, it's shrunk. And, and, and the options seem very limited. Eventually, of course, what happens is um, if you're tortured long enough, you eventually can't speak anymore. Um, because um, on one occasion you may give an answer and get beaten for it. On another occasion, you might, and you might think you've learned from that, I'll remain silent and you're beaten for remaining silent. Um, so um, you're confronted with impossible choices to disclose the names of people you don't even know, where you haven't been politically active, so um, it's not your war. Um, so very, uh, you're reduced, you're objectified, you're reduced to an object. Um, prior to my work uh, at STARS, I worked in Elizabeth with abused children. And it's very interesting. I, I, you know, you move from one position to another and often you feel, oh, well, this will be a steep learning curve. But I think all of your experiences um, uh, are part of your, become part of your repertoire, become part of who you are. And ultimately, when you're with a person, all you have is who you are and the quality of your presence with that person. Um, that's what's... V being present is very important. So eventually, I mean, people regress. <laughs> um, the, the, and, and I think, you know, one of the things you should keep in mind is that um, when you start to lose language, you start to lose a sense of self. You know, I've, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you have read the work of Lacan, who, who Jacques Lacan, a French, um, I guess, philosopher and psychoanalyst, who, who, who noticed that the, the, the emergence of language uh, occurs at the same time a sense of self emerges. Because, you know, the young child has begun to internalise uh, you know, uh, the world, 
and, and, and an identity starts to emerge, an internal world starts to emerge. So once you start to lose language, you, you lose your sense of self. The problem with the pain of torture is it's not socialised. Hopefully, most of us have not been tortured. When I speak of a toothache, you know exactly what I'm talking about, or a headache. But the pain of torture is, is not disclosed. It's not uh, well known. So it's uncategorised. Many of the clients that I've worked with have an obsession with medical services and pain. And there's always a, a psychological element to any pain. Um, but I think for these individuals, um, uh, quite often the first expression of their suffering is somatic. It's through their body. Headaches, stomach disorders, you know, um, aching backs and arms. Some of it is due to the torture experience itself, but a lot of it is also d due to their distress You know, so that notion of there being an elevated somatic focus. I'm not going to... I'll leave this with you guys. And, which is very interesting because if you think about it, um, if you have suffered a great deal, your body is always present. Well, for most of us sitting in this room at the moment, I mean, our bodies, are, unless you've got a, you know, an ache, and the, you know, unless I draw your attention to the seat beneath you, and the, you know, our body is phenomenologically absent that's a state of health. We're not aware of it. It's when we have pain that we become aware of it. For most of the people I work with, it's actually not their own pain that causes them the most distress. It's always the suffering of others and the impotence that they felt, you know, hearing screams coming from another cell and knowing what's happening but can't do anything about it. Quickly, the symptoms, I'm, I mean, most of you be aware of the uh, symptoms. PTSD is not a good descriptor necessarily of what um, war trauma survivors suffer. Certainly the environmental triggers, my little poem. Constantly remembering what's happened. They're intrusive memories. So it's not as if you sit alone and kind of um, begin to reflect on, on the past. It's always present and it intrudes. Horrific images. And at the same time as things are intruding, you're trying to push it away. You're trying to avoid it. I, I always think for some of the people I work with, uh, they're, um, they have one foot on the accelerator and one on the brake. And the engine just overheats and they kind of psychologically um, you know, uh, seize. Um, so there's a lot of avoidance and a lot of intrusive symptoms. And that numbing can be in all sorts of ways, you know, the, the narrowing of what you can experience. I'm going to have to stop soon. So, you know, I think the biggest problem I deal with is insomnia and nightmares. Um, you know, once they fall asleep you know, in the evenings, the distractions of the day are not so present. Really, all of our interventions centre around four things, I guess. Helping the person to feel safe in the, in the space that you're working. To develop some trust. The relationship you have with the person is the therapy. Many people underestimate this. I find certainly working with supervision with new staff, you know, oh, I don't appear to be doing much, but hang on a minute, you're establishing a rapport with the person and they're developing some relationship with you. Um, and, and so that, that reciprocal stuff. To um, restore meaning, many traumatic experiences don't have, make much sense. Cognitively you, and, and conceptually, you can't make sense of it. So it's very difficult to digest it in that sense. And to connect with the community. Ultimately, that's, that's, that's what we need to do. I don't want to end on that note because for many of the individuals I've worked with, and this will be my final thing, uh, is um, 
I've watched them grow and develop and offer support to others. And um, I think, you know, we all know what pain is and what suffering is, both emotionally and physically. Um, But there's also great potentials for growth. It's a great teacher as well. And uh, um, I think we've got to be very careful that the work is towards health. And health is, you know, this salutogenic model says, well, health is just not the absence of symptoms. You can be very unwell psychologically and exhibit no visible symptoms. Um, It's the presence of well-being. You know, a life. So, you know, many of my clients, you know, know, they're, they're more emotionally communicative. They're not fearful of expressing their emotions. A much more compassion towards others who suffer. They accept support and they can give support to others. Can I finish where I began? I worked with a, a, a man who'd been suffered, who'd worked, and this is the, where I end, um, uh, who'd suffered enormous uh, long-term imprisonment and enormous, had enormous scarring. And, you know, um, in fact, the first session I had with him, the first thing he did, I, did, I was quite um, worried about what he was on about. He pulled up his shirt to show me the contusions and scars over his body, and he basically told me he hated his body. And um, we spent a long time talking about the past. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, I got to a point where I found it quite depressing going to his small flat where he was kind of marooned, <laughs> you know, doors closed, always the, you know, the bloody blinds all pulled down and it was dark and um, it, it was, we seemed to be stuck forever in, in a despairing place. And I, could, I got sick of it. And one afternoon I said, Let, let's just go for a walk. And he happened to say to me, uh, after a while, it's a, it's a lovely afternoon. It's the sunlight. So the dead are not completely left behind. And words fail endlessly to eclipse the loss. He thinks he might never belong here, which is a common experience for refugees. Still sometimes in the warm October air when the sun has torn free of cold winter skies, it seems possible to shed these clouds that block other ways of seeing things. And I think a lot of our work, um, certainly with mental illness, I find is it's got something to do with those clouds. Thank you. Thank you.